What if I told you that beneath your feet, hidden in a forgotten shipwreck or tucked away in an ancient burial mound, could lie treasures worth millions, even billions of dollars? But what really makes them so valuable? Is it the weight of the gold or the history they hold? Let's take an adventurous journey through time and across continents to unearth some of the most staggering treasure finds in history, starting with a mysterious burial mound in England, the Sutton Hoo. Journey with me to Egypt, 1922. Howard Carter, an archaeologist backed by the wealth of Lord Carnarvon, made one of the most significant archaeological discoveries of all time, the virtually undisturbed tomb of the pharaoh Tutankhamun. After years of fruitless digging in the Valley of the Kings, Carter's persistence finally paid off. He discovered a flight of steps that led to a sealed door and beyond it, a world untouched for over 3,000 years. Inside the tomb were four rooms filled with items that offered an invaluable glimpse into the wealth, sophistication and culture of ancient Egypt. These items, more than 5,000 in total, were meticulously recorded by Carter and his team over the course of eight years. Among the treasures were chariots, statues, a ceremonial fan, food and wine jars, and personal items of the boy king. The centerpiece was the stone sarcophagus containing three nested coffins, the final one made of solid gold. Inside lay the mummy of the young king adorned with a dazzling funerary mask of gold and lapis lazuli, considered one of the most beautiful artistic creations in the world. This mask alone weighs about 22.6 pounds of solid gold and is one of the most iconic symbols of ancient Egypt. Valuing the treasures of King Tut's tomb is an almost impossible task due to its historical, archaeological and cultural importance. However, if we were to consider just the raw materials, the price of gold alone for the burial mask would today be around $600,000. But the real value lies far beyond the cost of materials. When the treasures toured in the late 1970s, they were insured for an estimated $36 million. In today's dollars, accounting for inflation, that would be close to $144 million. But the actual value of this window into ancient Egypt is truly immeasurable. It's 1622, Spain. The Nuestra Señora de Atocha, a heavily armed galleon, set sail from Cuba back to Spain, laden with an unimaginable wealth extracted from the New World. The treasure on board included 24 tons of silver bullion, 180,000 silver coins, copper ingots, gold coins, emeralds and other precious jewels. But fate had other plans for the Atocha. Just a day after setting sail, it was caught in a furious hurricane, sinking it near the Florida Keys and taking its treasure down to the bottom of the sea. Fast forward to the 20th century, enter treasure hunter Mel Fisher. Fisher spent 16 relentless years searching for the Atocha, overcoming hardship, doubt and the tragic loss of his son and daughter-in-law in the pursuit. His motto was, today's the day, a testament to his undying belief that he would find the Atocha. And in July of 1985, Fisher's dream came true. They found the main pile of the Atocha, a mound of silver bars and other artifacts, the heart of the ship's lost cargo. The Atocha treasure find was enormous, the mother load as Fisher called it. The treasure trove contained 40 tons of gold and silver, 114,000 Spanish silver coins known as pieces of eight, gold coins, Colombian emeralds, golden chains, and hundreds of other artifacts. Today, the salvaged gold and silver alone is worth over $400 million. But the story doesn't end there. Even though the main pile of the Atocha has been found, many of the ship's precious jewels are believed to still be scattered over the ocean floor, lost to the sands of time, waiting for the next Mel Fisher to declare, today's the day. Our final destination lies beneath the Atlantic Ocean, a world away from the Silk Road, where the story of the SS Central America unfolds. Also known as the Ship of Gold, the SS Central America was a 280-foot sidewheel steamer that operated between Central America and the eastern coast of the United States during the 1850s. In September 1857, she was caught in a hurricane and sank off the coast of the Carolinas, taking with her a treasure trove that played a pivotal role in the California Gold Rush. The ship was carrying a hefty cargo of gold prospectors returning from California, laden with their hard-earned nuggets and coins. When the ship sank, it was carrying an estimated 21 tons of gold, a loss that contributed to the Panic of 1857, a financial crisis that shook the United States. Fast forward to the 1980s, 
when a group led by marine engineer Tommy Thompson used evolving technology and extensive research to locate the shipwreck and recover a portion of its treasure. The treasure that they managed to bring up from the seabed included thousands of gold coins, hundreds of gold ingots, and countless gold nuggets. The exact value of the ACES Central America's treasure is difficult to determine, as it depends on the weight, purity, and collector value of the individual pieces. However, the recovered gold was initially insured for $100 million when it was brought up in the late 1980s. Auctions of the treasure have since brought in tens of millions of dollars, and the full value of the recovered gold is thought to exceed $150 million. The majority of the treasure still lies at the bottom of the ocean, its exact worth unknown but undoubtedly colossal. The tale of the SS Central America is a reminder that sometimes the sea keeps the most glittering secrets. Our journey takes us now to Afghanistan in 1978, where a Soviet Afghan archaeological team unearthed six burial mounds in the province of Jiaoxian, near Shebagan in northern Afghanistan. The site, known as Tilia Tepe or Golden Hill, held an extraordinary discovery, a treasure hoard from an ancient nomadic tribe known as the Bactrians. The tombs contained over 20,000 pieces of jewelry and precious objects dating back to the first century BC golden bracelets, necklaces, medallions, crowns, belts, and even boot buckles, intricately designed with a mix of Hellenistic, Indian, Chinese, and nomadic influences. The most iconic piece from the hoard is perhaps the collapsible crown of one of the female nobles, adorned with a tree of life motif, showing the sublime craftsmanship of the time. This treasure, commonly referred to as the Bactrian Gold, offers a golden window into the life, culture and the wide-reaching connections of the ancient Silk Road. But what's even more remarkable is the story of its survival. During the turbulent years that followed its discovery, the Bactrian Gold was thought lost or stolen. However, it was safely hidden away in a vault in Kabul, only to be rediscovered in 2003 thereby safeguarding an invaluable part of humanity's shared cultural heritage. So, what is the worth of this magnificent treasure trove? Placing a value on archaeological artifacts is challenging, but expert estimates suggest that the gold alone could be worth over $200 million. However, the historical and cultural significance of the Bactrian gold makes it in many ways truly priceless. Picture the calm countryside of Suffolk, England in 1939. Edith Pretty, a wealthy landowner intrigued by the mysterious earthen mounds on her property, hires self-taught archaeologist Basil Brown to investigate. As Basil digs into the heart of the largest mound, he uncovers an undisturbed ship burial, an incredible rarity of its kind. The burial belonged to a high-ranking individual, likely a king or a noble warrior from the 7th century. The ship measured a staggering 27 meters in length, but its contents were even more awe-inspiring. Buried within were a collection of artifacts with unrivaled craftsmanship and material richness, reflecting the pinnacle of the Anglo-Saxon period's artistic and technical capabilities. Among the items were weapons, including a sword and a shield, both highly ornamental and inlaid with garnets. More than 40 gold items were found including a gold belt buckle that alone weighs 400 grams. Intricate shoulder clasps adorned with garnets and intricate filigree work coins from Frankish mints and a purse filled with gold coins were also discovered. But the most iconic find was undoubtedly the ornately decorated helmet, a symbol of sovereignty and martial prowess restored from hundreds of fragments into a grand piece of history. Now, estimating the monetary value of the Sutton Hoo treasure is challenging because it's not just about the weight in gold, but also the historical and cultural significance, which is simply incalculable. For comparison, a single artifact from the Staffordshire hoard, another Anglo-Saxon treasure was valued at £3.285 million, about $4.3 million in today's terms, in 2009. And the Sutton Hoo finds are even more significant. Though we can't attach a specific dollar amount to the Sutton Hoo treasure, its invaluable insight into the Anglo-Saxon world spirituality, artistry, and power dynamics makes it a priceless treasure of humanity. Stepping away from sunken ships and royal tombs, we find ourselves in the quiet town of Panagiuriste, Bulgaria. Here, in 1949, three brothers were digging clay for bricks when they stumbled upon a remarkable golden artifact, setting in motion a discovery that would shake the archaeological world. 
The brothers had discovered the Panagiurisht treasure, a golden hoard dating back to the 4th to 3rd centuries BC. The treasure consists of nine vessels, including a firely, three wine jugs, and four writers. Each of these pieces was ornately decorated with scenes from Thracian mythology and custom, revealing the deep and rich cultural tapestry of the Thracian people. One of the most stunning pieces, the Amphora Riton, is believed to be a ceremonial vessel. Crafted in gold, it is adorned with scenes depicting a Thracian ruler and a procession of servants, warriors and elders, giving us a glimpse into the courtly life of ancient Thracia. What's most astounding about this find is not just the gold itself, but the exceptional craftsmanship, the exquisite detailing and the storytelling through art. The weight of the treasure is approximately 6.164 kilograms of 24 karat gold. Considering the cultural and historical value plus the raw gold value, it is estimated that the Panagurisht treasure is worth at least $200 million. But can you really put a price on a discovery that has unlocked so many secrets of a long-lost civilization? For many, the true value of the Panagurisht treasure is not in dollars and cents, but in its priceless contribution to our understanding of the human past. So there we have it, an odyssey through time and space, chasing gold, history and the human spirit. From Sutton Hoo's ghostly ship to the sunken SS Central America, and from the Golden Pharaoh to Tancarman's resting place to the Thracians' exquisite golden hoard in Panagurishte, we've uncovered not just treasures but narratives, civilizations and cultures that once flourished. After all, we know the real treasure lies not in gold or gems, but in the knowledge and understanding we gain. Prisons. We think of them as a modern institution, a way of punishing those who break society's rules. But did you know our ancestors also had their versions of incarceration? From Rome to Persia, from England to ancient Maya, history is filled with examples of humanity's attempts to deter and punish crime. But these weren't prisons as we know them. Let's take a journey back in time to some of the most brutal and fascinating prisons in history. How did they treat their inmates? What weird and fearsome rituals did they perform? Buckle up because we're about to delve deep into humanity's past to uncover the dark underbelly of ancient societies. The heart of ancient Rome gives us our first destination, the dreaded Mamertine prison. This centuries-old edifice, steeped in tales of brutality, provides a gruesome glimpse into how the mighty Roman Empire dealt with its enemies. You see, the Romans were no strangers to discipline, order and, yes, punishment. One thing that stands out about the Mamertine prison is its structure, or rather lack thereof. This wasn't a prison with bars, cells and guards, instead it was more like a dark, dank pit, hollowed out directly from the Earth's crust. It was located at the base of Capitoline Hill, primarily underground, and was more of a dungeon than a prison as we know it. It was said to have two gloomy, damp chambers, one atop the other. Prisoners were first placed in the upper chamber known as the Tullianum, this chamber was around 12 feet high and 30 feet wide and deep and could accommodate a considerable number of prisoners. However, the place was a far cry from comfort. It had a single opening at the top through which prisoners were lowered into the darkness using a rope or a chain. But the real horror was the lower chamber. At this was where prisoners who were sentenced to die were sent. In stark contrast to the Tullianum, this room was smaller darker and suffocatingly close, known for its inhumane conditions. Historical records, some as old as 22 centuries, suggest that the Mamertine prison was often used to contain high-profile prisoners, enemies of the state. One notable inmate was said to be Saint Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus Christ, who was allegedly incarcerated here before his execution. But it was not just the physical torment that made the Mamertine prison infamous. The psychological terror of being in such a place, the oppressive darkness, the dreadful anticipation of passing, and the agonizing wait for execution. These were perhaps even more tormenting than the actual physical conditions of the prison. Indeed, the Mamertine prison serves as a chilling reminder of Rome's darker side, a testament to the Empire's harsh, often brutal system of justice. Let's travel further east to the ancient city of Xanthos, located in what is now modern-day Turkey but was then part of the Persian Empire. Here the prison was not a building or even a complex, but a singular macabre artifact, the wooden horse of Xanthos. This wooden contraption, known in ancient texts as the horse, was a chilling form of both punishment and imprisonment. 
showcasing the truly inventive, if not horrific, forms of incarceration in the ancient world. Designed with a hollow interior, the horse served as a grotesque echo of the famous Trojan horse. However, this was not a vessel of soldiers, but a container for pain and suffering. Prisoners were placed within the horse, their bodies contorted to fit the cramped interior. Once inside, they were at the mercy of the elements with the scorching sun during the day and freezing cold at night. But the horror of the wooden horse did not stop there. It was raised high above the ground, meaning that once a prisoner was inside, escape was nearly impossible. The public humiliation, the physical discomfort, and the psychological torture of being trapped within this wooden monstrosity all contributed to making the horse a truly terrifying form of punishment. Moreover, the wooden horse was not used for long-term incarceration. Instead, it was an end-of-life sentence. Prisoners placed inside the horse rarely survived the ordeal as the grueling conditions led to exhaustion, dehydration, and eventually their untimely passing. The wooden horse of Xanthos serves as a chilling reminder of the inventive and brutal forms of punishment humanity can devise. Journeying a bit northwards, we find ourselves in the heart of London, England. It is here that one of the oldest and most notorious prisons of ancient Europe stood, the Bridewell Prison. Established in the 16th century, the Bridewell was initially intended as a palace for Henry V. However, its destiny was to become something far more sinister, transforming into a house of correction. A penitentiary for the city's beggars, vagrants and petty criminals. The building was impressive, boasting over 100 rooms and a grand courtyard, but the grandeur of the palace was a stark contrast to the harsh reality of life within its walls. Inside the Bridewell, prisoners endured a unique form of correction, one that focused on reformation over punishment. Inmates of Bridewell were made to work. Hard labor was seen as a tool of reformation, a method to correct their idle ways. The work was grueling. Women were often employed in beating hemp for making rope, while men were put to work on physically demanding tasks. All this under the stern and watchful eyes of the prison staff. Yet what truly made Bridewell infamous was the severity of its punishments. These were not just physical, but also public. Whipping, for instance, was a common form of punishment, typically administered at the whipping post for everyone to see. This served a dual purpose. It was a form of correction for the prisoners, but it also served as a deterrent for the onlookers, a chilling demonstration of what awaited those who stepped out of line. But life in Bridewell wasn't just about work and punishment. It also served as a refuge for the homeless and the destitute. Yes, it was a prison, but in a time when social services were virtually non-existent, it also provided shelter and a form of social security for those who had nowhere else to go. The Bridewell prison, despite its brutal reputation, provides an intriguing glimpse into the early evolution of the modern penal system. It was here that the concept of reformation through labor was first put into practice, a notion that for better or worse has been a mainstay of prisons around the world ever since. But let's not forget the Americas. Shifting our gaze across the Atlantic, we find ourselves in the heart of the ancient Mayan civilization, renowned for their advanced mathematics, calendar systems, and of course, their brutal penal codes. Notably, we have the infamous prison of Kitala, a true testament to the harsh and fearsome world of Mayan justice. Kitala wasn't just a prison, it was an arena of punishment designed to inflict maximum suffering and disgrace. The very architecture of the prison was designed to reflect this. Deep pits, known as chultuns, were carved directly into the limestone bedrock, creating vertical prison cells from which there was no escape. But what makes Kitala so chilling is not just its physical form, but also its psychological and spiritual dimensions. The Mayans held a deep respect for the earth and believed that being buried alive was one of the worst punishments imaginable. In this light, the Chultuns of Kitala represented not just a physical incarceration, but a spiritual defilement. Conditions in Kitala were harsh, even by ancient standards. Prisoners were subjected to physical and psychological torture. They were deprived of food and water, left to endure the sweltering heat and tormented by the knowledge of their impending doom. There's also a grim irony to Kitala's purpose. The Mayans used chultuns as a method of water storage during the dry season, essential for their survival. Yet these same life-giving structures were also used as a tool of torment, a stark reminder of the dual nature of human innovation. 
the chilling echo of Kitala still resonates today. It's a stark reminder of the brutality of the ancient world. And here's something you might not have expected. Ancient Egypt, a civilization that has fascinated us for millennia, has left behind traces of an infamous detention system in Elephantine Island. This is a place where prisoners were not just physically confined, but also psychologically tortured. Elephantine Island, located in the Nile, was the site of a unique prison system in ancient Egypt. Its isolation made it an ideal place for incarceration. Prisoners were ferried to the island and left there, isolated from society and surrounded by the unforgiving Nile. But the imprisonment didn't just involve physical isolation. Ancient Egyptian society was deeply spiritual with a profound belief in the afterlife. They believed that in order to reach the afterlife, a person's body had to be preserved, and so mummification was common practice. Here comes the chilling part. To instill fear and punishment, it's said that the prison guards on Elephantine Island would threaten to throw the bodies of dead prisoners into the Nile. The idea of their bodies being lost and destroyed, denying them access to the afterlife, was a terrifying prospect for these ancient people, making their imprisonment not just a physical but a deeply spiritual punishment. Records of Elephantine Island also suggest harsh living conditions. The prisoners were put to hard labor, forced to quarry stone and load boats under the scorching Egyptian sun. Food and water were scarce and the hot, dry air made life incredibly difficult. So there we have it, a journey into the brutal realities of ancient incarceration. From the suffocating Mamatine prison to the psychologically terrifying Elephantine Island prison, we've seen how prisons were not just physical institutions, but psychological ones as well. These harrowing tales of punishment and survival give us a fresh perspective on the societies that we so often romanticize. As much as we marvel at the architectural splendors of Rome, the scientific wonders of Persia, the cultural richness of England and the spiritual depth of the Maya and Egyptians, we should remember that these civilizations like ours had a darker side. Thanks for joining me on this journey and remember, the annals of history hold many more such intriguing and sometimes terrifying stories and as always thanks for watching.